Greetings, Word Horde. We're here with an exciting option for you, a version of our podcast without any ads. That's right. No advertising interruptions, just the content you love, ready to go in your favorite podcast apps like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's another way to support the show, ensuring that we keep bringing you the word stories and language explorations that you love. Try it at waywardradio.org slash ad free. And it's affordable. For just a small subscription fee, you can enjoy a way with words uninterrupted, except by us. Plus, it makes a great gift. Know somebody who loves language as much as you do? Give them the gift of words. Easy to sign up, easy to enjoy. It's the same away with words, just streamlined for your listening pleasure. Go to waywardradio.org slash adfree. Support us, support the show, and enjoy an ad-free listening experience. waywardradio.org slash adfree. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. We got an email from Rasul. He lives in Iran, and he's been listening to us there in the city of Mashhad for several years for help in learning English. And he wanted to ask a question about the expression fat chance. He writes, The word fat implies a sense of abundance, and biblically speaking, I've heard that fat people were considered blessed in the past. But what has happened to this idiom that when we say fat chance, we mean no chance? Oh, yes. That's a very good question. <laughs> it right? is a really good question. When right. you say fat chance, you don't really mean that uh, something is likely, right? Right, right. You can't stare English directly in the eyes. It's like looking too closely at the sun. <laughs> <laughs> you have to shield yourself from it. <laughs> um, yeah. We have the other things like that in English. We say um, um, big deal. And we don't mean big deal. Exactly. And there's something in the tone that you, the way you signal that big deal. Right. It means small deal or no deal. Right. Because you could say, this is a really big deal. I need you to pay attention to it. And that, and sounds, that's that sounds like you meant it. Yeah. If I say smart move, you know that I didn't mean smart move. Probably you know what I meant? Not. Dumb move, right? Yeah. Right. And so some of it's tonal that if you're only reading these expressions, you won't pick it up probably mm -hmm. unless the context is very good. Mm -hmm. um, if you're hearing it in a podcast, you probably will get some of it. Face to face, you'd probably get a lot of it. Right. You'd pick up the irony or the sarcasm. Right. right? There's an inversion that happens with a lot of casual or colloquial language. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. The yeah. intent is more about context and not about the words themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. So, Rasul, thank you for that question. We welcome questions no matter where you are in the world. You can send us email to words at waywardradio.org. And you can go to our contact page on our website, waywardradio.org slash contact. There are a bunch of ways that you can reach out to us no matter where you are. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Kathy Birch, and I'm calling from the Rocket City, Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, Whoa, love we Huntsville. love Huntsville. We had a good time there. <laughs> oh, when we were awesome. there. Yeah. I um, I called in about a saying that my my dad used to say, and he was a kind of a you know long tall Texan, you know, full of tall tales and colorful language. And um, I can't remember a lot of the sayings, but the one that I was always curious about was um, whenever we had guests over, when it was time for them to leave, that, you know, everybody would stand up and start saying goodbye. And my dad would say, don't leave now. We're fixing to open up a keg of nails. <laughs> and I always wondered about that. Like, I didn't know that nails ever came in kegs <laughs> and what would be so great about opening one of those kegs. So It didn't make people want to stick around? <laughs> Did they stick around? Do a little yeah. light carpentry, something oh, like that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I always wondered if it was maybe um, like an Amish thing, you know, where they would all get together and build a barn or something. So, But he, he was from Texas, so... Uh that's not a bad guess, but it's it's a different direction. A keg of nails looks a lot like a keg of alcohol. Yes. And so the suggestion <laughs> is when you say stick around, we're going to open a keg of nails, is that you're actually going to get out another keg of beer or a keg of liquor. Uh, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Well, that would be the reason that he said it, I would say. <laughs> 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 this expression goes back to at least the 1860s. You can find it uh, just throughout all the places. I had a heck of a fun time digging this one out of old newspapers. In the old newspapers, they often talk about also cutting into melon, like a watermelon or some other kind of melon, and opening a keg of nails. You'll find it in newspaper ads, for example. They'll lure customers in. Well, what they'll say is, I love this, come by and have a lemonade. 
and <laughs> and they'll also say, we'll open a keg of nails. And so both of these, when they're in the newspaper ads, are euphemisms for come by and have a drink of alcohol. Because they couldn't say come by and get schnozzled. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't say really come by and have a whiskey with us. So what they said right. was come by to our hardware store. Uh, take a look at our lumber and tools and have some whiskey. So come by and have a lemonade, wink, wink. Come by, we'll wink, open a keg. Wink. Yeah, come by <laughs> and we'll open a keg of nails, wink, wink. And so you'll often find this mentioned uh, again and again and again uh, when people want to say we're going to have some alcohol. It's, a, uh, it's just a kind of way of saying we're going to have a drink. And during these times and places where alcohol was just a little more disreputable than it is now. <laughs> Okay. Kathy, does that sound like your dad? It does. does. It absolutely does. This is a question that we have, for some reason, we have never talked about on the show before. This is the first time we've answered it, Kathy, so thank you. Oh, fantastic. Well, thanks for taking it from me. Yeah, sure. Pleasure. Take care now. And uh, thank next you. time you open a keg of nails, give us a call. I sure will. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks, Kathy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 877 Hello, you have a way with words. Yes, this is Nancy Farrow from Dallas, Texas. Hello, Nancy. Welcome to the show. When I was teaching preschool, which was a very long time ago, one of my little students didn't come to school, and her mother taught there also. And I said, Marsha, what is wrong? Why isn't Jill coming? And she said, I don't know. She's afraid to come. And I said, oh, gosh. So it went on for a couple of days, and then finally Jill said that I kept saying there was going to be a mean time because we were getting ready for a big program. And I would say, yeah, we're going to do this and this. But in the meantime, so Jill was afraid there was going to be a mean time. (laughs) A time to be mean? (laughs) She thought there was a time that everyone was going to be mean. Exactly. To avoid the mean (laughs) time. That makes perfect sense. It's perfectly logical, right? If you didn't know what in the meantime meant, (laughs) that's a great parsing of that phrase. (laughs) Uh, no. <laughs> I wonder how she figured it out or who explained it to her. I don't know, and I don't know what Marcia said. It was so long ago, and her mom doesn't live here anymore. I did text um, Jill to tell her I was going to do this, and she was pretty tickled because she has her own children now, and she said they're going to be excited to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess what she didn't understand was that um, mean in that sense means occupying a middle place. It comes from a Latin word that has to do with with the middle. In fact, it's related to words like middle, that kind of mean. Oh, man. So mean is related to the French moyen, right? Right. Mean middle. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, all those words. Mean time, meanwhile. Oh, poor little Jill. (laughs) I'm glad she figured it out. (laughs) Great. Well, Nancy, you got to call us again sometime. Maybe you'll remember some other story like that. All right. right, Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. All righty. Bye-bye, Nancy. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, we love those childhood misunderstandings and those stories from your past about language. Give us a call, 877-929-9673, or send it to us an email, words at waywardradio.org. Grant, you remember our conversation about medieval book curses? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When medieval scribes would sometimes actually put curses in the books. To stop people from stealing the books. Yeah, yeah. Well, that prompted a wonderful email from uh, Justin Furman. He's a professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He does glass blowing on the side. And he sent a copy of a page from the great glass blowing classic beginning glass blowing by Edward Schmidt which includes a curse because it was a handwritten book early on and the curse goes may all your glass check that means may all your glass crack may you suffer from inexplicable minor burns and cuts and may all of your creative juices dry up like the Mojave Desert should you copy or reproduce this book in any fashion without the written consent of the author (laughs) <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Check. So check to crack. Yeah. Isn't mm-hmm. that interesting? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I also didn't realize that glass blowers are called gaffers. 
gaffers. Yeah. So if you're a gaffer and you photocopy that book, you're probably going to be dropping mm. glass on the floor. I wonder why they're called gaffers. A gaffer in other fields is someone who has things on the end of a long stick. Mm-hmm. I wonder if it's because they have their blob of glass on the end of a stick when they put it into the kiln. 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. This is Maria Altamirano. I'm here in San Antonio, Texas. Well, excellent. What can we do for you? Me and my boyfriend go fishing quite often. He mentioned the word jetty, like, oh, we're going to go over to the jetties. And um, I actually grew up in Denver, Colorado, so it was a word I never heard before. And when we went over, you know, it's the, well, it was a lot of uh, rocks that kind of go out like a pier. Mm-hmm. And the word just didn't make sense to me. Like, you know, the root, the suffix, I'm like, jetty, why would that be called a jetty? And so I was like, oh, I'll call you guys. You touched on the origin of the word jetty, which has to do with projecting out or, or something that's sticking out. It goes all the way back to a Latin word that has to do with throwing. And that jetty uh, comes from a Latin word that gave us a whole bunch of different words involving throwing, like eject, which is to throw something out, uh, interject, which is to uh, throw something in between, project, like a jetty is projecting out into the ocean. That's something that mm. is, is kind of, thr- yeah, thrown out. Um, even jettison, you know, or, or jetson, when you're throwing something overboard. Uh, they all go back, and, and tour jeté in ballet oh. is a thrown turn. And so it involves all these words uh, that uh, have to do with throwing. And so a jetty is something that's sort of thrown out there into the ocean. Jetty, yeah. I could see that. Yeah, and actually jetty is an, also an old word that, that uh, is used for like part of a building that's projecting out, like over the sidewalk or something like that. It, it has to do with projecting. Awesome. Well, you guys answered my question. Thank you. Take care. It's so satisfying to have a word that we can do the etymological history to yeah. and actually take it back. So so often we can't yeah. do that. We hit the these breaks, or these mm-hmm. pauses, or these holes, but mm-hmm. we can do that. Right? Yeah, and then you start seeing all these connections mm-hmm. going back to the Latin. So connected to, you said, ballet and architecture. Tour jeté, yeah. Adjective. Ad- Adjective is, is a word that's thrown up against the a noun. J-E-C-T How is cool is that? in the middle of the word, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh. 877-929-9673 or email us words at waywardradio.org or talk to us on Twitter at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. I just learned the word inkle, I-N-K-L-E. It's a kind of strip of colorful linen that's woven on a really, really small, simple loom, and then it's used for trimmings on shirts or dresses, that kind of thing. Inkle. And the reason that I came across that was because I was looking up uh, the expression thick as thieves, and it turns out that another way that you can say that people are, are really close is to say thick as inkle weavers because the looms are so small and you could cram a lot of people into a room because inkle weavers are going to be close together because the looms are so small. So this is like the word ankle with an I, uh-huh. like ankle. not the part of the body. Inkle. Yeah, ankle. Like the ink, like I N K. Yeah, we don't know the origin huh. of the word inkle itself, but an inkle. inkle weaver is somebody who makes those little woven strips. If you look up an inkle on uh, Google, you'll know what I'm talking okay. about. You, you've seen them before. Surely. 877 929 Hey, we've got something special for those of you who love our show but could do without the ads. That's right. Imagine away with words, the same engaging conversations, the same deep dives into language without advertising interruptions. We're talking about our ad-free podcast feed. It's sleek, clean, and it's just for our supporters. It's at waywardradio.org slash ad-free. It's inexpensive, easy to sign up for, and works with all major podcast apps like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It's an affordable way to support the show and get a seamless listening experience. And if you're feeling generous, why not give a subscription to another Away With Words fan? That's waywardradio.org slash 
ad-free. Sign up today. Your support means the world. waywardradio.org slash ad-free. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Martha Barnett. And I'm Grant Barrett. And we're joined by that miraculous man, our quiz guy, John Chinesky. Hi, John. Hey, Grant. Hi, Martha. Hello. Hello. What's happening? It's time for the quiz. We all know that the point of language is to make yourself clearly understood. However, those of us with a particularly cheeky bent oftentimes enjoy using circuitous or obfuscating language for our own amusement. To that end, I'm going to use this quiz to encourage the use of words that have an archaic tag in the dictionary. Now, I'll give you a word, and the first thing we'll do is determine if either or both of you already know what it means. And then I'll use it in a sentence that will give some clue to its meaning, and then finally we'll figure out what it means. All right? Oh, boy. Well, here's an example. Accouchement. Three times in the past decade, the Duchess of Cambridge has experienced accouchement. That sound right to you, Grant? You think so, yeah. It does, because what does it mean? I think it means to be laid up pregnant. Yes, exactly. Mm. Uh, from the French mean to put to bed. Now, we're not saying she's only slept three times in 10 years. What it means is childbirth. She's, uh, it's the process of giving birth, right? Mm. Now, let's try some more. First one is Bridewell. Have either of you heard of Bridewell? I... Hmm. Uh, it's vaguely familiar, but I think as a name, not as a n- mm-hmm. not yeah, as a, not as a word. Say, okay. Place. Well, here's my sentence. I told my kids if they continued their heinous behavior, I'd send them off to a bridewell. Oh, like yeah. A prison or something? It, yeah. Is it a reform yes. school? A reform school for petty offenders. It's uh. a toponym. Uh, apparently, there was a one of these institutions by St. Bride's Well in London. Very uh, good. Very huh. Right. Darby's. Do either of you know what a Darby is? Yes. Sure. Go, both of you. Good. Now, here's my sentence. Before you move the accused to his new cell, you best slap the Darbies on him. And what does it mean? Handcuffs. Handcuffs, right. Now, apparently the source of this is Father Darby's Bonds, which is a rigid agreement between a usurer and a client. But, of course, now it's in actual physical handcuffs. But it's never been used in the United States, though. <clears throat> Not in the United States, no. Unless, like I said, uh, unless I get it to catch on, just to make people's lives more... Uh, interesting. Here's the next one. Glim. Spell oh, it. G L I M. Glim. I have a couple ideas just because it tends to be popular with the people who write fantasy fiction. Hmm. Yes, that sounds like you're on the right track. Here's my sample sentence Spending the night in an abandoned castle, I'll need a glim or two if I want to read my ghost stories. Like a candle or something? Yes, Martha? A candle or something? A candle, yes, a word for a candle. Now, of course, we know words that have glim in them as glimpse and glimmer, but remember, this is this is archaic. So candle is now glim. Nice. Finally, sanative. I'm much better now thanks to a sanative week at a resort in the Greek islands. So a, a, a curative, a restorative week. Mm-hmm. Yes, sanative means healthy. Right. But I think this quiz is quite healthy for all of us, quite sanitive indeed. I'll yeah. talk to you guys next week. Thanks, bud. Thanks. Take care. Well, we talk about all kinds of words on this show, and we'd love to talk with you about the ones you're curious about. So call us, 877-929-9673, or send your questions and stories about language to words at waywardradio.org. Hi there. You have a way with words. Hi. This is David Jambra. Hi, David. Calling from you? Livingston, Montana. Livingston, Montana. Well, welcome to the show, David. How can we help you? I uh, was listening to a radio show a long time back. It was uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, He was playing a detective, and he said it was from 1954. He said the phrase, sweet and groovy, like a nine-cent movie. And I didn't realize that word had been in use in the early 50s. And I was very curious uh, what the earliest... um, usage of the of the word groovy you know what year that was kind of what kind of context was uh he saying that in he played a character that was you know kind of a hep cat you know and so it was uh sweet and groovy like a nine cent movie correct okay and it was it was positive overall positive oh 
Oh, yeah. Um, it's and actually groovy had already been around as a slang term, meaning generally positive or cool or with it or hip for a couple mm-hmm. decades already. By 1937, it had come up from jazz as a positive term. Um, in, in jazz, 30s, well. groovy meant that you were able to swing, that you could really play. You had chops. You had your bones. You knew how to find an improvisational groove and just really play hard and cool. Mm-hmm. And that you could put yeah. down some some kind of music that other musicians could get into with you and that they could groove on to. And you could do it for a really long time. And that was what groovy was. And then that was borrowed out of jazz into the regular slang vernacular. But do you want to hear something even cooler than that, even groovier than that? <laughs> sure. David, before there was the slang groovy that meant cool, groovy mm-hmm. used to mean boring. That's interesting. Oh, yeah, get stuck in the groove. Yeah, you know. exactly. Oh, okay, like in a rut. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As early yeah, as the yeah. 1880s, to be groovy meant to exactly that, to be stuck in a groove or to be stuck in a rut. And huh. so you'll find newspaper articles. Here's one from the 1920s. It, it talks about a groovy as a noun. It's a person who doesn't like anything that requires him to change his habits. Oh. It says he is <laughs> he is apt to make it hot for any member of his family who becomes modern, for modern things irritate the groovy. They <laughs> interfere with his mental and physical laziness. The groovy is usually against progress and reform in his community, too. The groovy is a terrible person, sounds like. <laughs> But a gro- uh, a I groovy. love how words change all <laughs> yeah, the time. Right. That's fascinating. <laughs> but then by the 1930s, that old sense of groovy as a boring person or as an adjective meaning boring disappeared, and groovy became uh, an, an adjective meaning uh, cool or with it or hip. So the jazz musicians took it kind of and flipped it over to make it something uh, really good and... and uh, yeah, I think that, it was independently derived. They they both come from the sense of being in the groove, but one is a positive groove and one is a negative yeah. groove. <laughs> yeah. All right. How about that? Well, thank you so much. Yeah, Pardon? groovy. Thanks, David. Thank you. Bless you. Now I'm seeing all these psychedelic <laughs> colors, you know, and and the letters for groovy, like you know, oh, from the 1960s. Distended, yeah, kind of Peter Max. I'm not or thinking of like. that. I'm You're think, not? no, I'm thinking of Swing Street, New York City, rainy sweat jazz streets, musicians. the the dark smoky jazz clubs. I'm thinking of groovy back in when groovy was new, a new slang word. You know, oh, you walk okay. down these steps. Yeah. There's a bouncer at the door. Maybe they'll let you in. Maybe they won't. <laughs> you can barely see through the mush of the crowd. It's sweaty and smoky, right? That's the groovy uh-huh. I'm thinking of. Okay. I'm picturing my Simon and Garfunkel album. <laughs> We'd love to hear your questions about language, so call us, 877-929-9673. Moore in San Antonio, Texas writes, When I was in second grade in the 80s, we would usually stop in the bookstore after a dinner out. It was a small local place, and we would all wander off to our favorite sections to find something new. On my way to the kids' shelves, I was intrigued by the tiny orange and white books on another shelf titled Thesaurus. I immediately thought, Dinosaurs! And cool tiny books, so I went to check them out. My mom found me 20 minutes later sitting on the floor in the reference section and laughing hysterically. She was pretty puzzled when she realized I was reading a thesaurus and that I really wanted to buy it. This is full of words that mean the same thing, and they sound really funny. Listen to this. Pulchritudinous. You know what that means? Beautiful. (laughs) She says, I still have that pocket thesaurus over 30 years later. It opened a window into the world of language that I happily climbed through and never looked back. I'm a speech therapist now, sharing language with those who struggle with it, and I dabble in learning other languages as well. 
Aww. She's a fellow nerd. She's Aww, one of yay. us. How about that? Claire, and helping other people, too. I love that story. Too. Yeah. I love that a little kid seeing thesaurus and thinking, <laughs> oh, boy, raptors and <laughs> T-Rex. The marvelous and... <laughs> Pulchritudinous is one of her first encounters. <laughs> Pulchritudinous dinosaurs. Thank you for that, Claire. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. And thank you for listening. Give us a call, 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is uh, STD Noor calling from uh, lovely Madison, Wisconsin. Welcome to the show. How can we help? Thank you. Well, I had a surgery a few weeks ago, and uh, before the surgery, I found myself sitting and thinking about my surgeon and uh, hoping that he is the best and, and that he would do a great job on me. And um, then my mind went to the fact that... Um, he is a surgeon, and yet he wasn't going to surge me or surge on me. <laughs> he was going to operate on me, and yet he's not an operator. He is a surgeon. And try as I might, I, I really couldn't find connection between these two verbs or two words, and uh, makes no sense, really, that a surgeon will be operating. So my mind, of course, um, went to you guys, and um, hopefully you can explain it. Well, we'd be glad to try. Surgeon is a really interesting word because it comes to us via French, and it goes all the way back to two Greek words that literally mean just handwork. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? It is just simply somebody who does handwork, and it happens to be medical. And mm -hmm. uh, the Greek word for hand is hair, uh, which uh, was borrowed into English in an older word for surgeon that you sometimes see in old books. Um, and it's spelled C-H-I-U-R-G-E-O-N. Through the influence of French, we ended up with the word as surgeon. And it literally means hand work. And the, the E-R in there uh, from the Greek word ergon, which means work, is related to a whole slew of other words in English like ergonomic, uh, which is, you know, what mm -hmm. you want when you want your work to be uh, lined up correctly so that you don't get hurt. Or synergy, which is uh, energy together, working together. It's also related to the word George. The name hmm. George. The name George, which comes from the Greek word for farmer. It's it's a geo worker, George. Uh -huh. So they huh. all are connected to this word surgeon. And the word surgeon used to mean just a plain old um, doctor. You know, the surgeon general that we have today isn't necessarily a surgeon. He doesn't uh -huh. cut anything. So right. why do they operate on you and not surge on you? Well, that's interesting. I mean, that's that's from the Latin for work. Um, but uh, the surgeon is, is specifically handwork. <laughs> so we didn't backform the verb from the noun, right? Right. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah. We didn't need the. We didn't need to do that. We already had the operate verb. Yeah. Mm. So what you're saying is that the the verb operate existed before surgeon became surgeon. Yeah. Well, the operate verb, is, yeah, it did already exist, and it's kind of a general purpose verb that kind of just. We operate on many things. We operate machinery. We operate uh, um, yeah. uh, business. We yeah. Operate, yeah. So it's just kind of general purpose verb. Yeah, and they, they just arose independently of each other. I mean, I mean, an opera is, is a work by a composer, or your modus operandi, your M.O., is, is your method of working. So mm -hmm. they sort of have the same idea, but they grew up completely independently of each other. Well, okay. Thank you for the... Um Explanation to, you know, to the degree that it explained, actually. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jesse. Um, <laughs> Take care now. It's a Thanks. great question. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. 877-929-9673. Hi there. You have a way with words. Oh, thank you. My name is Steve Resnick. I live in the town of Sandwich on Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Well, Steve, we're really glad you called. Well, my mom, my Finnish immigrants came to Cape Cod in 1912, and my mom always said the only Finnish word in the English language was sauna, or how the Finns would say it is sauna, uh, you know, like a steam bath. And I was always curious to see if that was the only Finnish word in the English language. So your mother's people were Finnish from Finland? Yes. So your question is, is sauna or sauna 
the only yep. Finnish word adopted into English. That's correct. All right. So we can kind of puzzle this out by going into the biggest English dictionary, which is the Oxford English Dictionary. It's the most complete so far. It doesn't have every word, but it's got a lot of them. And we can search the etymologies for words derived from Finnish. Uh -huh. And this is going to get us a lot of entries. It turns out, though, there are only 75 results in that dictionary that mention the word Finnish. And so we can kind of eyeball those. Not all those entries are from Finnish. They just mention the word Finnish. And using my native speaker's intuition and my experience as a person who has made dictionaries, I can look at that and I can tell you I would indeed say that sauna or sauna is, listen, the most common everyday word that is from Finnish that is in English. Notice that qualifying word, everyday. So it's not the only word from Finnish that's in English. It's the most common everyday word that's in English. There are um, a lot of specific cultural names and other things from Finnish um, Stuff like a Finnish knife and a sledge and a type of rug and a type of granite and an old unit of currency that are sometimes used in English and specialty texts. But they're always used in English in association with Finland or Finnish culture. They're never, never used in English without also being associated with Finland. And so they're kind of... so. But sauna is used on its own in English without any connection at all to Finland or Finnish culture. And so that, I would say, is a perfect isolated adoption into English. Okay. I would say that the other word that I hear most often when I think of Finns is, you know what I'm going to say. I think so. Say it. Sisu. Sisu. That was my number two. So do you know this word, S-I-S-U, Sisu? I do not. Well, that's a, that's a, um, a kind of bread, right? Uh, no. So this was added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 2018, and it was defined by the editors of the OED as strength of will, courage, and resilience in the face of adversity, regarded as qualities and attributes of the Finnish people. But it's a distant second behind mm -hmm. sauna. It's like way down in the word list, like way down, like probably not even the top 10,000 words. Well, thank you very much. I do listen to you guys uh, quite a bit, and I do enjoy your show. All right. Thanks, Steve. Take thanks care of yourself. Calling, and drive Steve. safely out there, all right? Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I do like that word Sisu, S-I-S-U, that has to do with grit and resilience and determination and all those qualities that you would need if you were in one of those Finnish settlements up there in northern Wisconsin. Right. Absolutely. Because you can't do it without a lot of internal strength, right? Sisu. Guts. Yes. yes. Internal There's power. A lot of pride right. in that word, right? Mm -hmm. Call us with your language question, 877-929-9673. You know, thinking about childhood misunderstandings, Grant, it occurred to me the other day that I had a big light bulb moment. I'm not sure how old I was, but I might have been in late elementary school or early junior high school when I realized that the State of the Union was talking about the condition of the United States, mm -hmm. the State of the Union. I had thought for the longest time that it was a competition every year. They were going to announce the State of the Union. And every year I was thinking, oh, I hope it's going to be Kentucky. <laughs> You're very state proud. <laughs> I was very state proud, and and I guess I, you know, I heard about all this build up to the yeah, state of the sure. union, and yeah. then I, I guess I never heard the actual speech. So I was just hoping that Kentucky, all of Congress my is gathered, home, right? And I was just hoping my the home state, is there. yeah, your home state's going to get recognized, <laughs> yeah, for the greatness. It's, <laughs> it's it's due. It's time. Right, Kentucky time for Kentucky to get what it's owed. <laughs> That's wonderful. 877-929-9673. Got a minute? We need your help. Head over to gum.fm slash words and share your thoughts in our quick survey. Your feedback matters. It's the backbone of our show's success. Thanks for making our show even more successful. That's gum.fm slash 
W-O-R-D-S. Thank you. You're listening to Away With Words, the show about language and how we use it. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. I've been thinking a lot lately about the advice that I would give to young Martha starting out as a writer. You know, the stuff that I wish that I'd known when I was first uh, learning to, uh, to try to sell my prose. And the reason I was thinking about this is because there was a wonderful essay in the Writer magazine by Bonnie Hearn Hill. She's a novelist, and she wrote um, what, what's basically just a list of all the things that she wished that she had known when she started out. She says, for example, I'm glad I figured out that there is no secret. Writing is an art and a craft. We're born with a certain amount of one, and we can learn everything we need to know about the other. The best way to learn is on our own work. And the other one I really like is she says, I wish I'd known that if the story doesn't take off until page 142, you better start it there. Oh, those are both <laughs> so good. The, the, the advice that there is no secret is true for everything, not just writing. Isn't Absolutely it? everything. <laughs> just show up. I don't right? care what you're trying to do. There's no <laughs> secret. And so anytime I see ads or say the secret to blah, 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 I'm mm-hmm. like, that ad's junk. That ad's junk. Yep. That ad is junk. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The more I thought about this, the more I thought that a couple of the things that I wish I'd known were about starting and stopping. Uh, The starting is that I wish I had taught myself to start much earlier than I think I need to. You mean earlier in the day or earlier in life? Well, earlier in the process of writing a particular uh, book or paper or article because you need that time to just put it aside and let it sit, let Ah. it cool off. You know, stick it in your drawer so and come back the next further away from the, the deadline. Day. Yeah, yeah. And then come back and look at it after it's had a chance to cool because I guess I became a pretty good editor because I can I can look at what I wrote yesterday and think, oh, that's terrible, that's terrible, that's terrible, and fix it up really nicely. And that's one thing that, that I agree with in this essay, the idea that you should um, not be editing while you're writing. Oh, that can yes. just mm-hmm. be deadly. And the other thing about stopping writing, you know, you get to the point where you're overworking it. And, and I literally now force myself to, you know, set an alarm and stop. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, Very good. Because you can just get into it too far. And, the, and... there's a rescue that comes with that alarm going off. The, <laughs> the relief of it. No. And you and you congratulate that alarm. You thank the alarm. <laughs> but you said something a moment ago, which I don't know if it's on her list, but it would be on my list. The ability to look at your own prose as if it's someone else's. Oh, yeah. That's a good and one, the, right? And to not feel too strongly about your own writing and to treat yourself fairly. To be kind of suspicious of your own writing. You're <laughs> like... What was I thinking is <laughs> is the best sentence that you can say about your own writing. Oh, that's what was I thinking? What was I thinking? <laughs> and that is a real nice expression of um, of not not that that's golden or that's awesome. Those are two terrible things to say about your own writing because you're probably not being fair to yourself. Hmm. What was I thinking is probably a better thing to say about <laughs> everything you put down on paper. I guess I start asking myself that question. When I read my work aloud, I've talked mm-hmm. about that before, mm-hmm. but I think there is no substitute for reading your work aloud and, and you start tripping over your own words and you think, what was I thinking? And, you know, and there is a real linguistic explanation for that is because many, if not all people, sub vocalize when they read, which is they actually have tiny micro movements of the voice box in their throat when they read. They actually more or less speak when they read, only they don't make the sounds. Well, if you're into writing and and have ambitions of getting published, this is a wonderful, wonderful essay in the current issue of The Writer magazine by Bonnie Hearn Hill. And we want to know your tips. What are the things that keep you going as a writer? Because we know we have a ton of writers out there. What are the things that you would pass on to the new writers? What are the tips that will make them the great novelists of the future? 877-929-9673. Email words at waywardradio.org or tell the world on Twitter and us at W-A-Y-W-O-R-D. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is uh, Robbie in San Antonio, Texas. Welcome to the show. What can we do for you? Um, I had a question about a saying that my mom um, used to say to us kids when we were younger. Um, she lived in Germany for a long time, and um, the saying, I know it's a German saying, but she used to say it uh, in English to us, and it was, it fell between chairs. And uh, I guess 
you know, it kind of means that two people had like an opportunity to do something, but then both of them didn't do it. Anyway, I was wondering how come there isn't like an American version of that, or if that's just a German specific um, saying. Well, there is a very similar expression in English for that. So you're saying the one that she uses, it fell between two chairs. So two people were supposed to do something, but neither one did it, so it didn't get done, right? Yeah, exactly. It's for me and my brother. <laughs> okay, for you and your brother, yeah. Like, So somebody was supposed to empty the trash, but nobody emptied the trash, right? Exactly. Okay, <laughs> we all know that. We've all been <laughs> yeah. there. Um, so in English, we might say that um, a person sat or fell between two stools, or they sat on two stools rather than on two chairs, although sometimes on two chairs. And it occurs in English as early as the year 1390, if you can believe oh. that. Yeah. And it incurs um, variations on this, either chairs or stools or sitting on two chairs or sitting on two stools or falling on two, between two chairs or falling between two stools. It occurs throughout European uh, languages and cultures as early as the year 60 B.C. It occurs in Latin in the writings of oh, Seneca. Wow. It's crazy, right, that we can track it yeah. back that far. And often they also talk about falling on your bum or falling on your butt. Um, and no. the whole idea <laughs> is that if you can't make up your mind between two things, you're paralyzed by choice. And if you're paralyzed by choice, you're just not going to move forward. And you're just not going to do the thing that you should do. And you're often going to end up in a ruinous situation. Wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. I was uh, I was curious because I remember being in school when I was a kid, and I would I would use that saying, and people would be like, "What are you talking about?" And like, <laughs> you know, it it seemed to me that it was a like a family specific saying, and it wasn't until college that someone heard me say that, and they're like, "That's a German saying," and then you oh, know, nice. kind of figured it out from there. Huh. Yo, know, so it's interesting when we talk about these expressions on the show. Martha and I hear from listeners who also know them, so we know that they're out there. But I guess we kind of need to reassure everyone that these proverbs, aphorisms, sayings are not pervasive, and there's no reason that they should be pervasive, that they are sprinkled throughout English-speaking cultures and societies. There's some that are more well-known than others and some less known than oh, others. Okay. So, But they're out there and that they exist, and there's always going to be um, some kind of uptake problem, some kind of... Uh, record scratch moment where you say a thing and other people are like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think what people are more used to hearing in this country is it fell between the cracks. Fell if between... something didn't get done, but that's... it fell between the cracks. Yeah, well, that's more what his what that's more what that's more his mother was saying, yeah. which is a little different than the two stools problem, right? So falling right, between yeah, the cracks. Yeah, because that one's a, a two-person specific yeah. kind of uh, saying there. So falling between the cracks is about a thing not getting done. Right. But um, falling between two stools is more about a person being indecisive and then not making a decision. Uh huh. Yeah, it reminds me of, of somebody sending an email to two people thinking that maybe that will better ensure mm -hmm. that they get an answer, but then they don't get an answer from either one of them yeah. because yeah. the other thinks the other is going to, each thinks the other is going to do right. it. Yeah. Oh, well, I really appreciate it. I'll definitely have to uh, to share it with her. Well, Robbie, thanks for sharing it with us. Yeah, of course. Right. I love the show. I love listening every uh, every weekend. So Thanks, Robbie. Sweet. Take care. Take care. All right. You have a good one. Bye. All righty. Bye-bye. Give us a call with your language question, 877-929-9673. got an email from Lisa Braun Glazer here in San Diego, and she says, my canasta group is desperate to know if the following is a thing or a fantasy. Is there an expression, breasting your cards, describing what you do when you hold your cards close or when you'd like your opponent to hold theirs up? Breasting your cards? Absolutely. You're holding next to your breast, right? Holding to your chest. Yes, absolutely. It's a thing that you do. And, and if you look at Guides for new card players, they often talk about the kind of willy-nilly way that amateur card players just hold their cards as if anyone can see them. They talk about breasting your cards really? and holding. Yeah, because no new card players really don't have this sense of, oh, here's a word, proprioception. They don't have this 
real understanding of what their body is uh, doing. Proprioception. Proprioception yeah. is Yourself. kind of this, this yeah. sixth sense of where mm-hmm. your limbs are. Mm-hmm. And so they don't know where their cards are at all times. So they talk yeah. about breasting your cards and keeping them literally close to your chest. Uh-huh. Or uh, your vest or, or your, your breast. Or your vest or your breast <laughs> so that other people can't see them. So, yeah, breasting your cards is a real huh. thing, and that's the term for it. Interesting. Yeah. But the game that you're playing when you're breasting yours, what does Elisa play here? What is the game that she plays? Well, she I say canasta. Do you say canasta? I don't I really say, play it, so I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, don't need, I don't know canasta either. I just canasta. know the etymology. Oh, yeah, because that's the fun part. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it comes from a Spanish word that means basket. Right. So thanks for the question, Lisa. Really appreciate it. Well, what's the word that you've been discussing with your friends? Send us an email, words at waywardradio.org. Hello, you have a way with words. Hi, this is Vince from Norristown, Pennsylvania. Welcome to the show, Vince. What can we do for you? Well, I was I was listening to your show, and I was curious about the word couch versus sofa, whether it was a regional thing or not. Um, I also know my grandmother used the word Davenport. Uh, I don't know anybody else who's ever used that word, but you know, I don't know where that came from. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I know that there's, for example, there's couch potato. You know, and I also know that couch is sometimes used as a verb, but I was just curious as to, you know, whether it was a regional thing or, you know, what the origin of those two or three words are. Mm -hmm. And you're in Pennsylvania? Yes. And what do you say? I I think it's interchangeable. Um, I think generally I would say couch. Uh, this is a super complicated question to answer because we have all these different terms and plus a whole bunch more that you haven't mentioned, and it's only an hour-long show, so I'm going to just kind of skim across the top of this. I do want to talk about Davenport for a second. You said it was your grandmother who used Davenport? My grandmother and maybe my great aunt, her sisters, they would refer to it as the Davenport. Yeah, so this is uh, kind of like a couch, basically a couch, although some people do make a distinction. One thing that immediately leaps out is that our British listeners are going, that's a couch because in the U.K., a Davenport could be a writing desk. It's not a couch-like thing at all. Also, there are other kinds of Davenport, such as a divan or divanette or a divino, which was a brand name for a time of a kind of Davenport. So all these different kind of, they're just different. The overall message is that couch is winning out throughout North America, Canada, and the United States. Couch is beating up on the rest of these terms. Sofa is a strong second, but it's still a, it's still second. Couch over the last three four decades has kind of come to the fore. Now, I know you mentioned some other terms. We talk about sofa beds. We don't talk about couch beds. That's true. But in those idiomatic expressions or the compounds, we don't kind of count those. When we're talking about the standalone words, couch is winning. Um, And it doesn't have anything to do with couch potato. That didn't make it win. That's just a a coincidence there. So is is it a north versus south thing? Is it all across the country? No. Davenport, though, Davenport is the only one of these that really had a hugely regional aspect to it. Davenport was fairly common throughout the United States, although not in the south and not really in the North Atlantic. Um, but pretty much everywhere else, Davenport was used. But it is really fading. There are still people who say Davenport before you get angry and want to send me an email or call angrily on your telephone. <laughs> the Davenport Society. But I got to tell you, if you say Davenport, Davenport, Iowa. If you say Davenport for <laughs> a couch-like piece of furniture, you're probably over sixty, probably, or even older yeah. than that. And in Canada, there was always the term Chesterfield, by the way, which is never all that oh. common in the United States, but that's faded. Um, maybe people who were born before 1945 still use it, but Chesterfield is almost completely gone now. There is a book I want to recommend to you, and it covers mostly the, the mid-Atlantic states, but it's fantastic. It's by Alison Burkett. It's called Language and Material Culture. It is about the words we use for the things in our homes, the words for the rooms themselves. We think of ourselves as being in one culture. We are not one culture. We have lots of different words from state to state, region to region, geography to geography. We talk differently, and we describe our homes differently. And what's the name of that book? It's called Language and Material Culture. It's by Alison Burkett, B-U-R-K-E-T-T-E. Hey, thanks so much for calling. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Take care. All righty. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. 877-929-9673. Hello, you have a way with words. Hey, this is Pam Fuller calling from um, Denton, Texas. Hello, Pam. Welcome to the show. Thanks. I am super excited to talk to you guys. 
We're excited to talk with you. What do you want to talk about? My mother-in-law is from southern Illinois, Kentucky area. Mm -hmm. And so she has um, a long list of these interesting sayings that I have heard for many years. And I'm just curious as to where these sayings have originated. And the one that has always piqued my interest the most is that um, when my oldest daughter was born, my mother-in-law would always say, that girl is as independent as a hog on ice. (laughs) And I've been very curious about what that means and where in the world it came from. Independent as a hog on ice. Yeah, that's been around mostly in this country since the mid-19th century or so. And uh, a lot of times when you see the expression uh, independent as a hog on ice, there's a little bit of implication that they're so independent, so stubborn, that it's kind of to their detriment. Is that the way your mother-in-law used it? Like, Like maybe they're a little too independent for their own good. Maybe so. Maybe uh-huh. so. Could have been, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, but, yeah, have you ever seen a hog on ice? <laughs> no, but I'm sure it would be quite a sight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's not a pretty sight because they get stuck out there, and uh, they're just sort of spread-eagled or splayed out on the ice, and they can't move. It is to their detriment to be that stubborn to go out on the ice. Um, There's a book called Jack Shelby, A Story of the Indiana Backwoods, that has a longer version of this expression, which is as independent as a hog on ice. If he can't stand up, he can lay down. But anyway, this person in the book is describing um, what a hog on ice looks like. And he says, a hog on ice is the helplessest thing you ever see in all your born days. He can't walk and he can't stand. His feet ain't made for it. So as soon as he finds he's on ice where he can't walk and can't stand up, why, he just does the other thing. He lays down and there he'll lay till a crack of doom, perfectly happy and contented, like and just as if laying down on ice was the very one thing he was brung up to do. (laughs) Which sort of that's hilarious. You, yeah, yeah, it's it's great. It goes on to talk about how uh, this happens a lot outside Cincinnati because the river freezes over and they're driving hogs to the oh. distilleries across the river, and uh, they make a cinder path and the hogs walk across that. But sometimes they just get stuck. Um, so that suggests that that whole idea of maybe they're a little too independent for their own good. So the word independent here isn't oh. really independent. It's independent <laughs> in quotes, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of inadvertently uh, independent yeah. once they get stuck out there. So it's stubbornly independent right. or like yeah. inadvertently independent. Oh, I love that. I appreciate the explanation for sure. This one in <laughs> particular had always kind of had us the family stumped as to where it came from. <laughs> well, it's a beauty. And I appreciate you having me on and uh, giving me that explanation. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Pam. Take care now. Uh-huh. Y'all All right. Bye-bye. 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 Take care. Well, we loved Pam's story of what her mother-in-law said. What did yours say? Call us, 877-929-9673. Thanks to senior producer Stephanie Levine, director Colin Tedeschi, editor Tim Felton, and production assistant Caitlin O'Connell. You can send us a message, subscribe to the podcast, get the newsletter, or catch up on hundreds of past episodes at waywardradio.org. Our toll-free line is always open in the U.S. and Canada, 877-929-9673. Or send us your thoughts to words at waywardradio.org. Away With Words is an independent production of Wayward, Inc., a nonprofit supported by listeners and organizations who are changing the way the world talks about language. We're coming to you from the Recording Arts Center at Studio West in San Diego, California. Thanks for listening. I'm Grant Barrett. And I'm Martha Barnett. Until next time, goodbye. Bye. Hey, listeners, we have a favor to ask. We'd love for you to fill out our listener survey at gum.fm slash words. Your feedback is crucial. It's quick, and it helps us make our show even better. It shapes our show, helps us plan, and ensures we're bringing you the content you love. That's G-U-M dot F-M slash W-O-R-D-S. Thanks for being a part of what we do. Thank you.